Welcome to the District Court Show. I am Judge Strand. Judge Halsey is not able to join me today. Today we're going to talk about women in the law, and I have two fabulous guests here with me today to talk about the legal landscape and how it has changed since they first were admitted to the bar and up until the time that uh, they retired. First is Judge Lynn Olson. Judge Olson is a senior judge. She received her law degree from William Mitchell College of Law in 1977. Thereafter, practiced as a public defender, also as a, an assistant county attorney, and was appointed to the Anoka County District Bench in 1983. Welcome, Judge. Thank you. Also with us is Judge Ann Alton. Judge Alton graduated from law school in 1970 quickly obtained employment at, in 1970 as a Hennepin County Assistant County Attorney and was appointed to the bench in 1989. Yes. And then she still, after or during that time as well, has worked as an adjunct professor at four law schools. Right. Welcome to you as well. Thank you. At the time that you attended law school in the 70s, I, I did some preparation for the show. I note that only about 10% of the law students at that time were women. Judge Olson, I'll ask you as well, Judge Alton, what prompted you to get into the area of law when it was predominantly a male field? Well, actually, I think Anne went a little earlier than I did. Mm -hmm. I waited for quite a while before I went back to school. I did a lot of um, other things and then finally decided to go to law school because it was starting to open up. My law school class had about 20% women. And that was a real advantage because there were, there were a group of us. We didn't feel so alone. Uh, we didn't have restrooms. <laughs> At the law school? At the law school, yeah. It was a, it, that was a problem. But for the most part, I think um, we had a pretty good time. I was so ecstatic to be in law school. I'd been out of school for 12 years, and I was better prepared, I think, having spent quite a bit of time traveling and being a teacher, and um, so coming to law school was fun for me, and I didn't feel any discrimination particularly, just because I was a woman, but I think it was because that year, that particular year, we just went over the edge of um, that 5%, 10% women, and we jumped right up to 20%. So not a problem, really, for us. How about for you, Judge Alton? When I started law school <clears throat> at the University of Minnesota in 1967, there were 10 women in a class of 286. That's, That's not 5%. No. So we graduated 10 women, but two left, one within a week, escaped and two came in who transferred from elsewhere. So we graduated with 10, and because of the Vietnam War, my class was halved. So we graduated, I think, around 143. There were still 10 women. The first woman <coughs> I found uh, admitted to the bar in the state of Minnesota was back in 1878, and she had to work for one year to remove the word male from the attorney qualification statute. I would think at that time that would start a domino effect, but apparently it was it slow didn't. going. <clears throat> it was very slow. I had one professor, he was dean actually, <clears throat> Carol Auerbach at the University of Minnesota, who called on me every day in constitutional law, which was horrible. I had to be super prepared. I knew he'd call on me. I hated it. One day I didn't come to class and he came and found me and said, why weren't you there? But I finally figured out he was blind in one eye and I was the only person he could <laughs> identify. He wasn't being discriminatory. But at the time you may have thought that. I did. Okay. When you graduated from law school, you both went into the field of public work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you Judge Alton as a, 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 an assistant county attorney. And did you go right away into public defense? I did. Okay. I actually was a law clerk my last year at William Mitchell at the public defender's office. So then I just moved into um, a, an attorney once I graduated and passed the bar. Were there many women roles available in the private sector? I think at that point, things were truly starting to open up. There were still not many uh, judges. 
there were very few judges, in fact, uh, <clears throat> and there were very few partners in the private bar. But things were starting to open up for women. I used to advise women uh, in those days, the ones that were just starting law school, go outside the Twin Cities because uh, the chances of you getting employment were much stronger. Just because there was a lack, there were a lack of attorneys in, in outstate Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And so the um, chances of being employed in the private sector as well as in the public sector were much easier. I don't know how you felt because you were you were about seven years before had you graduating. Yeah. I had lots of offers for clerkships after my second year in law school. Big firms. Third year I couldn't get an offer because they didn't want to hire a woman for all kinds of goofy reasons. Like the bathrooms. There wasn't a bathroom for women lawyers, only for, for clerks and secretaries. So what? I didn't care. But they did. I mean, ridiculous kinds of excuses, but I wanted to, to, to actually try lawsuits. I figured that out in law school. When I was a second year student, I went to, I was in legal aid. I went to court for the first time with a name change client in a special term calendar with about 100 lawyers in it and all their clients. I was terrified. I had a supervisor because I was a certified student but I was terrified about this. My client wanted to change her name because her stepfather had raised her and she never knew her father. So I filled out the petition, being honest about the reason. And it was an older judge, William Gunn, on the bench, who said, please come here, Ms. Alton. So I went up to him and he said, please come with me. And I thought I was gonna die. I really thought my career was over right now. He took me to his chambers. He said, you don't have to be that honest on a petition. So he had his court reporter come in and cross out the part that said that she didn't know her father. I see. And just leave that she wanted to have her stepfather's name. And then we went, went back to court. He granted my petition and made me feel wonderful. Did your clientele trust in you because you were a woman? Actually, yes. That happened to me, too. Um, with the women that I represented, and I was a public defender, so I was representing prostitutes primarily, um, who were women. Um, the men I represented were um, all sorts of other wonderful crimes. But women tended, at, at least in those days, they were um, pretty much uh, their field was prostitution, or it was helping out, being like the driver of a... Um, or theft. Or theft, yeah. Theft was, theft was <coughs> another one, actually. Shoplifting, more likely. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a woman, another woman did, they trusted me, but the men did too. I didn't find, what I found was, they would say, you're a pretty good lawyer for a public defender because they didn't think public defenders were lawyers. And so that was really, I found that discrimination much more so than my being a woman, was the fact that they had a public defender because we didn't cost anything. Were you assigned specific cases because of your gender, either of you? No. Not in the public defender's office. Okay. I think that happened later. When you were prosecuted? When I was prosecuting, no, no, that didn't happen either. Okay. No, it was when I was first to judge. I see. Yeah. We'll get to that in a yeah. moment. <laughs> How about the reception from other members of the bar? When you first started practicing in the courtrooms, were well, you treated I, differently? One of my best moments was when I was waiting for the judge to come on the bench for sentencing. And the <laughs> lawyer for the other side for the defense stood up and said, we're waiting for the county attorney, Your Honor. Because they did not recognize you. He did you not recognize one. me as an assistant county attorney and was waiting for a man. And I had a, a couple of judges who commented on my short skirts. It was mini skirt time in 1970. And so I wore my skirts a little longer <laughs> <laughs> and tried not to be too ostentatious. 
and that worked just fine. I never I wore pants once to court. Did you have? It was really by accident. I never wore pants to court again. Why not, not in my career? Why not? The judge said, "Why are you wearing pants today in court? <laughs> you so, dress up like going to church." So there was an expectation of wearing certain attire yes, in the courtroom. There, there certainly was. was, and I know that Anne can remember this: that we all wore these little ties and little oh, su dark Lord. suits. Yes. Yeah, I always wore skirts too. I mean, that was just expected dress. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we sort of mirror men, but we look like women, but not too much. <laughs> because that would have been... It, we were trying, I, I don't know what it would have been, but I know we were trying very hard to fit in. And, mm -hmm. and after all, we had a client. And, and yes. your client was the state, my client was my public defender client, and I didn't want to do anything that made the judge irritated. And most of the judges were men, and they were, frankly, older men. And they, it took, they weren't used to having women appear as attorneys. What was wonderful is nobody ever told the jurors that women couldn't try judge suits. Yeah. The jurors were really willing to see women because we were a little different. Mm -hmm. They expected men. When they got a woman, I think they paid a little better attention. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating to them, and maybe yes. you use that to your advantage. Yes, I did. Did you find other times where your gender was to your advantage? I found my gender was to my advantage most of the time, quite frankly. How so? Well, the first thing that you mentioned was, and that you did, Anne, about the jurors, but it was true for everybody. We were unusual. And so if you were very careful and you did not allow yourself to get upset with, there were often comments that were made. And, oh, you're too pretty to be a lawyer. I mean, that happened when I was a judge, too. People would say things like you're that. You're too young. Or you're too young, or um, I don't know, just different kinds of comments. But if you laughed about them and you had a really good sense of humor, even with your clients, uh, it seemed to be an advantage. And I think part of it is because of the way women deal with situations. I was always trying to make things work out. I was really not very um, aggressive. I always felt like if I could just get back in chambers, I could talk the judge out of the bail he just sat, set out in the courtroom, <laughs> and I did. Most of the time, and again, most of my clients were um, public defender clients, and the bail wasn't ever very much. But if you could get them back in their chambers and you kind of sweet talk them, you know, they were used to their wives doing that. I guess I'm not really sure, but and it worked. Then <laughs> it worked. It worked. Wasn't it frustrating though to try to alter your true self or your behavior? <clears throat> Do you think no. men did, had, no. had to do that we the same way? I didn't alter my true self. Yeah. You didn't? At all. My best experience was when I first went to the county attorney's office, I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And my goal when I went to law school was commercial law, civil. But during law school, I decided I wanted to try cases. So when I went to court, I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do it with juries. No man believed women could try a case before a jury. As I said, nobody ever told the jurors that, but that's what the male perception was. So when I got into the county attorney's office, my first boss was George Scott, who then became a Supreme Court justice. There was only one woman who preceded me as an assistant county attorney. That was a wonderful woman named Suzanne Sedgwick, who later became a Court of Appeals judge. She was running for municipal court, and she had lunch with me and said, don't let George Scott put you into juvenile. Mm -hmm. Because that would be a natural fit for a female? That's what yes. he thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because there were no jury trials. Okay. So I <clears throat> enlisted the aid of all of the men I could find in the office and all the people in power to get jury trials, and I tried three cases right away when I passed the bar before a job ever opened up so I could prove <laughs> to Chief Ju to Justice Scott that I was able to try a jury trial. Absolutely fascinating. And I got his wife to lie with me too. 
It's time to take a brief break. We'll be right back with these two wonderful guests. Hey, what? Dude, slow down. You don't act like this in real life. Why would you do it behind the wheel? What? Minnesota law enforcement agencies are on the lookout for aggressive drivers. Can you could be fined or possibly lose your license. Are you that guy? Learn how to deal with aggressive driving at mndot.gov slash aggressive driving. Hey, come on, can't you go any faster? Before break, we're speaking with uh, judges Alton and Olson about their experience in the legal profession. We're talking about their employment in the public sector. Judge Alton, you were indicating that you were working as a, an assistant Hennepin County attorney. And during the break, you mentioned something funny, and uh, just wanted to ask you about that again. Okay. About uh, beating guys in court. Yes. It was Ex great for <laughs> most of my opponents. There were lots of public defenders, but private attorneys as well. And for a while, the men didn't really like being beaten by a woman. One of them, in fact, started taking tranquilizers <laughs> to get through the trial. He admitted it to everybody in court, including the judge. Because of the extra stress involved. Yes. Did you find that as well? I don't think any attorney ever needed to take tranquilizers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that ever happened. But I certainly do know one attorney uh, when I was a public defender and I had a pretty serious case and the verdict was in my client's favor, that uh, county attorney stormed out and never quite adjusted to the fact that he'd lost to me. Now, I'm not so sure that it was because I was a woman. I never believed that yeah, particularly. No. I think it was because <clears throat> County attorneys were not lose, used to losing, and I told him he should really be a public defender for a while, and he could more graciously <laughs> <laughs> lose his cases. Um, but what I did find with lawyers was, is particularly the older male lawyers, was that they would be surprised, and as Anne indicated, that you would walk into court and they'd still be looking for the attorney who was representing the other side. And so you had to convince them, and that was part of what I said about wearing the little ties and the suits and always being very, very professional looking. That's, that's so, we laugh about it now, about how we all wore those mm -hmm. bow ties, didn't we? Yes, in <laughs> fact, I went and got my colors done with a bunch of other women lawyers, many of whom were public defenders. I don't think you were on that particular gig, but that was fun. We did everything we could to look professional and try to look nice because we had something to prove. The first female judge appointed in the state of Minnesota was, I believe, in 1950 by Governor Young Dahl, the second Esther Tomjanovich mm -hmm. in 1977. There's a big gap there. Wow. Yes, indeed. And yeah. so, uh, Judge. Alton, you were appointed in 1989. Yes. There must not have been many women then. Judge Olson, you, 1983. <clears throat> 82, actually. Thank you. Yeah. And but, but the reason you made that mistake is that in 82, I was appointed by Governor Cui um, to the county court bench. We still had county courts then. And then shortly thereafter, I was appointed to the district bench, and in, in, that was in 83. Um, and that was by Governor Perpich. But the interesting thing about the first appointment was that Esther Tamyanovich was the only other female judge in my entire district, oh my. which included eight counties. It was Anoka and, and, uh, and it went over to Stillwater and it was a big area. At that point, Hennepin County had a few female judges. But Esther was, had been the only one, so she paved the way for me. But when I was appointed, one of the things I used with Governor Cui, I think, to convince him to appoint me, was uh, that as a woman, I had raised a family, I had um, taught school, I had lived in Africa, I'd lived in Australia and taught, I had done many things that many of the, young, the men who were 
um, also being proposed to be judges for that position, had not done because most of them had gone to law school and immediately, I mean, had gone to undergraduate school and then immediately gone to law school. Most of us women didn't do that. Most of us. Oh, I did. I went straight Did you? Through. Yeah, well, maybe that's why you were so early, but mm -hmm. most of the women in my law school class at William Mitchell had all done other things and were going to school late. And so that actually gave us an advantage. I was even if I got off the railroad, I'd never get back on the train. Ah. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> it's good thinking. <laughs> yes. What was re the reception from the bench like? Was it warm? Mm. No. No. Not particularly. No. <laughs> Were you, did you feel excluded, ostracized, left out of things? No, I was already scheduled to give a speech lecture talk to the judges about the fact that they were personally liable for employment decisions because I was doing the county's labor and employment law for them. For the last four years, I was in the county attorney's office. So I was scheduled to do this speech, and then I was appointed a judge. That threw them. <laughs> and the men were not terribly receptive to my telling them that, yes, they had personal liability if they made sexually harassed a staff person, for example, even though their official decisions they were immune from liability for. Did you feel a collegiality? when you joined the bench? With some of the judges, when I first joined the bench, there were only five of us in Anoka County really? as county court judges. The other four, of course, were all men. And two of them were very, very accepting. And in fact, it actually helped me in getting the appointment. One of them, uh, when I went into his chambers to ask him a question, he treated me like I was a law clerk that was bothering him. And I walked out of there feeling very, very irritated and also kind of chagrined that he would treat me like that. And he had second thoughts, and I will give him credit for this. He had second thoughts and later came back and apologized. Hmm. But it, I think it was difficult for him as well as some of the others but they stopped making rude remarks at judges' meetings because I'd call them on it. I, you know, one of the things I felt was I couldn't let them get by with some of the, the um, well, the, some of the comments that they made about the women lawyers um, or sometimes racist remarks, and I just couldn't let them get by with it, but always with a sense of humor. I always tried to make jokes. And somehow that seemed to soften it a little bit. But it wasn't always totally successful. You'd mentioned early on that you believe you were fed certain types of cases as a Oh, judge. yes. Oh, yes. What types? Um, uh, family court, divorce court. I had divorce court for the first eight months I was a judge. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yes. Although I must say that in that court, I learned a lot. And, mm -hmm. and uh, one woman, I remember one woman walking in and looking at me and saying, oh, you're a woman. Like, I didn't know it. <laughs> uh -huh. And she was so thrilled that she'd walked into a courtroom and a woman was going to actually hear her case. The men weren't so thrilled. And I had a number of, of men file against me because they thought I was going to be unfair to them in their divorce case. By filing, you mean removing you from their case and having someone else hear exactly. it? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it was a mixed, it was kind of a mixed bag, really. But that assignment was definitely, um, I was handed that immediately with no choice. <laughs> and you? Mostly in Hennepin County, things came on a wheel fairly. The civil cases came on a wheel. And criminally, you just took your assignment, whatever it was. So it wasn't a matter of sexism. Um, it's gotten a little different now in terms of assignments, but I, it was pretty fair when I was there, first few years. How was pregnancy handled for female attorneys and judges? Well, Pam Alexander, Judge Alexander, had a baby she, the first time she was on the bench, and I think it was handled very well. Mm. We didn't she really didn't complain. Esther and I were pretty beyond that <laughs> in <laughs> we age. Had <laughs> we both had families already. 
Um, and there was not another woman in the 10th Judicial District for a very long time. Uh, I can remember years going by, and I kept thinking, will the governor please appoint another woman? Because there were problems. One of the big problems was with certain kinds of cases that the men couldn't and shouldn't have taken. Uh, that having to do with making a decision about whether a young woman was old enough to make a decision about her health care. They considered it abortion. I considered what the law was, and the law said you had to determine whether a young woman was old enough at 17 and a half, you know, six months before she's 18, to make a decision about whether she could have an abortion or not if she didn't have both parents' permission. And I ended up having all those cases because the men didn't want to decide it. And they even said, oh, it's better to have a woman decide these cases, which seemed a little unfair to me because it was an overload for me. On the other hand, they didn't want to decide them, and mm -hmm. so that was that. Did the litigants treat you differently? I, I I recall one time when I was in court, uh, there was a female judge and a uh, litigant, a pro se uh, def defendant, uh, saw the H-O-N dot on the nameplate and call oh. started calling the judge Hun. Oh, yes. Okay. So, I've did, heard that. <laughs> did the litigants treat I you I was any called different? Sir a lot. Sir? Oh, but yeah. that was by lawyers <laughs> as much as any. We're just trying to be polite. Uh -huh. Sure. And the litigants would call me Sir, trying to be polite. Yeah. They're not used to ma'am or miss or anything else, mm -hmm. just sir. I do remember Esther Tamyanovich did not like to be called ma'am. I never Most really cared. Don't. Well, I didn't care because at least I thought, just as you did, they were trying to be polite and they mm -hmm. didn't know. It was a little confusing to them when they saw a woman up there. When you went into, onto the bench where you were fitted with robes, where, was it difficult just to was it a man's world entirely? Did your robes oh, fit? Were no, the benches no, made no. for men? <laughs> no, and no, and no. And the chairs didn't fit, and nothing fits, because the chairs are all made for six foot six tall men, and I'm 5'2". So nothing fit, and I've had to laugh as they've bought ergonomic things, because they're still buying them on the standard of a six foot six man. What's ergonomic for him has to fit for the women. Well, not six foot six. <laughs> there were, six but two. they were certainly... Um, many of them were as round as they were tall. And so we'd get these ropes that were like this, you know, even though it was medium, they were cute. Dragging on the ground exactly. as you're walking yes. around. Yes, yeah. If you could do anything differently throughout your legal career, you know so much more now than you did when you first started, would you have changed anything? Hmm. That's a good question. It is. I don't think I would have. No, I don't think so. Not much, nothing significant. You've both been trailblazers. It's been a good, good career. You've not let grass grow under your feet, either one of you. And I thank you and so I much. And I did do some things that I was happy to do and I wish it had been better adopted. I allowed jurors to ask questions of mm. live witnesses in civil cases. And I started that with my very first civil lawsuit. And I continued it until I retired. And very few judges, really only one, Judge Oleski, did the same thing after I did. But it is something I really encourage judges to do because you learn so much from the witnesses. They have good questions. The jurors know what's missing. And if they ask a repetitive question, one of the jurors didn't hear it. So I've always told lawyers, don't say repetitive. Let them ask because that person is not with you on whatever it is you're trying to prove. You two are absolutely fascinating. I wish we had more time here today to talk to you. As I mentioned earlier, we might have to do a part two. Judge Olson, be fun. Judge Alton, Judge Olson, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank fascinating you, stories. It was a pleasure, it was really fun. <laughs> thank you for joining me today.